first. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor this, after, uh, this evening uh, to welcome uh, two fine ladies to speak on the topic of the British Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, Carolyn Wilson and Sylvia Wilson, who I can honestly admit that I have known them since I first came to Collingwood. So, uh, when I was a child, so that was just a few years ago. <laughs> so I would like to welcome uh, Carolyn Wilson and Sylvia Wilson to share their history with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I remember fond times and wonderful neighborhood get-togethers. Well, my sister will be sharing part of the program this evening, and we're very grateful to have Marlene assisting us there. And wherever we go, we take our mother with us as well. And I looked around, and I see a lot of our friends from the neighborhood here, so this is great. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this, the warm welcome, the introduction, and the invitation to participate in your recognition of Black History Month. And for us, Black History Month is all year round. <laughs> so, actually, uh, this isn't the first time that we've crossed paths. I recall the Historical Society supported our church in the late 1960s and a special pantomime of our founding families. They were very interested in who we were. And at that time, we all dressed in old-fashioned attire and sang spirituals. And it was our late Uncle Wilford, Reverend Wilford Sheffield, who narrated the play and spoke of our history. Well, what a celebration it was at that time, and the church was full. Well, here we are all again. And tonight, you will have an opportunity to participate and revive some of those songs. In researching our history, we learned that there were various pockets of black settlements and settlers throughout southern Ontario. Oral history tells of hearing singing and music echoing over the hills from the black settlements and the settlers in the valleys. For us, music was an integral part of our experience, part of our lives. Survival on a southern plantation meant one had to find very creative ways to communicate and yet not be noticed. Over the years, and slave families on different plantations used the plantation grapevine and the talking drums to convey messages. <coughs> that tradition used in Africa. However, once the master recognized this mode of communication, it was outlawed. To outsmart the laws, the slaves then used their bodies in dance, in imitated drums, by using bare feet on the wooden floors. And only those with a keen ear could discern the codes. Since slaves were from different dialects, tribes, and customs, music became the common denominator in their efforts to survive. Codes, coded signals, maps, and messages were used during the Underground Railroad period. And I'm sure you know many of those codes, et cetera, and the history. When African traditions started to fade from memory and their memories as generations passed and changed, which happens, the Christian stories and hymns were adapted to inspire their own means of survival. Slaves related to the story of Moses, go down Moses, free your people, the flight out of Egypt, and gave new meaning to those hymns. That's my mommy singing over there. <laughs> These words 
offered practical advice on how to escape bondage. Thus, the spirituals had a double meaning. The song, Follow the Drinking Gourd, referred to a constellation pointing north. The spiritual about Jordan River, roll, Jordan, roll, signaled the Ohio River had to be crossed. And Canaan land, the promised land, freedom, was just on the other side. The message was, I'm leaving this land of bondage, and I'm going to a land of hope and milk and honey. And at this point, you're going to join me in a song. It's called, I'm on my way to the freedom land, and I might take the first line, and now don't worry, if you cannot <coughs> sing, everybody sings in our group here. So, I'll sing the lines in the black, and you sing the lines in the red, and are we ready, choir? <laughs> I'm on my way, on my way to, the to the freedom land. I'm on my way. and the conductors, or the angels, would soon be arriving to take the passengers to a di distant safe house. So we were always talking about heaven and going home, and the master didn't know we had other plans. And the verses, <laughs> if you get there before I do, I'm coming to wait for me. So all the time we were right there hidden in plain view, just as Mrs. Hartley's quilt hidden in plain view. So let's try this song. Swing low, sweet chariot. Let's see. Mm, not too high. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming forth to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming forth to carry me home. Well, I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. Carry me home. A band of angels coming after me. That's it. Coming for to carry me home. Because you're going home. Swing low, swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me Riverside, can we pass that one up? 
finally, when the last river was crossed, there were songs of celebration and jubilation. Oh, I have to feel it. And that's how people express themselves. They carried the burden of slavery. No more. It was no more. And they sang down by the riverside. Shall we do that song? And then my sister Sylvia will do part two. Gonna lay down my burden down by the riverside. All the way down. would be exposed to all aspects of European tradition and their way of life. Also, there were the missionaries who were determined to save those poor black Africans and introduce them to Jesus. And in this way, when blacks were finally permitted to worship in their own churches, 
The religious patterns followed were Anglican, Presbyterian, Catholic, but predominantly Baptist and Methodist. As black congregations grew across the United States, they started to unite under certain titles that showed their denomination. First Baptist Church, Freeborn Baptist, Wesleyan Methodist, Free United Methodist, Episcopalian Methodist, <laughs> and finally, so you made sure you didn't end up at the wrong church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. <laughs> A lot of blacks by this time had left the states and had settled in various communities in Ontario. Some were fugitives, some were freeborn, some were black loyalists. But they brought with them whatever traditions and customs they had learned in the South, and that included their beliefs and their own need to worship. In or about the year 1834, Certain ministers at the African Methodist Episcopal Church of the United States, or we call it the AME Church, came over to Canada and preached among portions of the colored settlers who were of the Methodist persuasion. These small church groups were formed into classes and societies. About 1838, these societies had increased so rapidly that Bishop Brown and other ministers of the AME Church came over to Canada and organized an annual conference known as the Canadian Annual Conference. And this Canadian conference, however, was still under the control of the American ministers. In a few years, this arrangement of a Canadian church being subject to American organizations wasn't working well. Trying to maintain Canadian attitudes while receiving directions from an American bishop American church doctrine and conflicting American laws of freedom versus slavery, and especially the fugitive slave law, this just wasn't going to work. Now, the fugitive slave law was in 1850, and black men and women who had gotten to Canada had to have proof or written documents that they were indeed free, or they had to have a white person with a highly uh, reputable social standing, vouch for them, normally in a court of law, that they were of good standing in the community and had lived in that particular area for some period of time. Often, proof of a black person's legitimate freedom became a court case and the judge had to decide whether this person should be deemed a free man or he was still property of a southern master. Then slave owners or their bounty hunters under the fugitive slave law, even if they were born in Canada, were taken back and returned to their masters as lost property. So, in 1856, a request was made by the Canadian Annual Conference to the AME Church in the United States, setting out the disadvantages under which the Canadian Church was laboring. They wanted to withdraw from the AME connection. The American Conference agreed and worked with the Canadian Conference to organize a distinct, separate, and independent church in Canada. On September 29, 1856, ministers and delegates of the societies in Canada met in the chapel in Chatham, Ontario, and officially organized an independent church body to become known as the British Methodist Episcopal Church. Chatham Church then became known as the Mother Church of the BME Connection. Now there's a new kid in town, the British Methodist Episcopal Church. But remember, these little churches are only societies of men gathering together who were earnestly searching for redemption and salvation. They were not ministers. They have been mentored and guided by American ministers, and now they've separated from their only source of religious doctrine. They begin to build upon the only foundation they are familiar with. Now, there were BME churches all through Canada, in Nova Scotia, the Bermudas, and even in South America. But five ministers, represented only 19 churches in Ontario, 
and they made application to King George V to incorporate the British Methodist Episcopal Church, and it was granted May 6, 1913. This new organization was under like one of the leaders of Reverend Ball, and the churches were Windsor, Woodstock, Brantford, Collingwood, <coughs> Owen Sound, North Buxton, London, Niagara Falls, Fort Erie, St. Catharines, Guelph. I could not locate pictures for Toronto, Stratford, Dresden, Harrow, Ingersoll, Peel, Puce, and Simcoe. Those are the nine churches that became BME. Now that we're independent, we want to have our own little social status title. Well, the BME elected as their first bishop, Reverend Willis Nasri, who had previously been a bishop in the AME Church of the United States. Reverend Nasri was set apart and released from the AME so that he could now serve the new church body in Canada. There were no elections during a bishop's reign. Bishops were in for life. Bishop Nasri held this office from 1856 until his death at Shelburne, Nova Scotia in 1875. 19 years. Now while good, um, Reverend Nasri was the first bishop of the BME Church, some of the men belonging to the societies now had been taking training to become elders and deacons in the church, and they wanted to become ministers too. They had to take an admission exam and learn the required doctrines, religious, and scriptural studies for the next four years. And once they accomplished this training, they were now eligible for leadership and the ministry. Reverend R. R. Disney had been such an elder for years. He was elected as the next bishop, but five years later in 1880, he started negotiations towards organic union between the Canadian churches and the American churches. He wanted to merge back into the AME conference body. BME churches did not want to go back to AME, so at the next general conference in Windsor, Reverend Disney got the boot. <laughs> this was a first. They impeached a bishop. The Canadians were getting a little feisty in this young group. <laughs> Reverend Walter Hawkins, another ordained elder, was elected as head of the church. But while retaining everything else in the Constitution, one thing was changed. It was decided to change the title of the executive officer from bishop to general superintendent and to elect him every four years at a general conference. Reverend Hawkins was elected for two consecutive terms until his death in 1894. <coughs> Reverend Charles Washington, again an ordained elder, was elected and four years later in 1898 at a general conference in London when it was time for elections. He thought it was time to restore the title of bishop. They want to be in for life. <laughs> and he reinstated Reverend Washington as such. He continued in this office for the next 10 years until his death in Woodstock. A special conference was called to elect someone to fill the office, and Reverend Samuel R. Drake was elected. It was also determined to restore the title of general superintendent, <laughs> and he should be elected every four years. <laughs> now here's a little side note. The office of general superintendent was the official title of the BME conference until 1977, not too long ago. Reverend Alex Markham resolved to negotiate union with AME churches again, and he unilaterally proclaimed himself a bishop without consent of the BME conference. <laughs> Five churches opposed this. Owen Sound, Windsor, St. Catharines, North Buxton, Collingwood. <laughs> Upon Reverend Markham's death in the early 1980s, the Office of General Superintendent was reinstated. 
we were at that conference, Carolyn, and not to be disrespectful, but when a minister unilaterally just puts a crown on his own head, buys a robe and a $5,000 ring, he's more than just a bishop. <laughs> okay. In the early days of Collingwood's development, black families were beginning to build their homesteads. Not comfortable and well-established churches where congregations were predominantly white and the services weren't so lively and rhythmic, the black community met in their homes or they held <coughs> cottage prayer meetings. It wasn't long after these prayer meetings that white neighbors started to come over and a lot of families were intermarried. So your spouse's families were coming over. So the houses were getting a little full until finally the need for a church building was realized and plans were begun. On September 23, 1870, the acquisition of Lot 29 south side of 7th Street started with a collection of $5 to go towards the purchase of the property from a Mr. George Watson. The total purchase price, hold on to your hats, $15. <laughs> but that was a lot of money in those days. One way of collecting money was in clay jugs, and these jugs were unique as they couldn't be opened. <laughs> On a designated day, all the members got together and they broke the jugs, and the money collected was put towards the future church. The original church, called Little Chapel, burned down a few years after its construction. And I might just point out, you see on the roof, there's a pipe. Well, here in this corner at the door was a big pot belly wood stove at first, and then it became an oil stove. But I remember being a little kid, you got there early in the morning for Sunday school, <laughs> and we held Sunday school around the stove with our little paper shaking because it was so cold. And the only heat through the church was the pipe so that some warm air would blow down on the minister while he preached. So no wonder it burnt down. A second building was erected around 1905. In I wasn't here in 1905, so I don't remember that part. But I do remember the pipe. In 1932, a front stoop and a back addition were added. And this back addition was divided into two sections, a meeting room, and a kitchen, and many foul suppers were served from this small kitchen. And that small kitchen would be, hmm, maybe from those chairs to where I am, and not quite to Carolyn's knees. It was pretty tiny, and they served a whole community. And we were just laughing. Their foul suppers, duck, chicken, turkey, goose, and the women of the community would get together in the mornings and pluck them all, <laughs> and then cut them all, and then serve them all. And they had tables in that little room, they had tables set outside, and the whole community came. It was a gathering of friends. <coughs> now here's a little nostalgic moment. This is the Collingwood Church back in the mid-1940s. It's decorated for a special occasion. That's my mom and dad. <laughs> the first wedding in the church. The couple at the top in the middle are mom's parents. And today would be her mother's, mom's great mother, her birthday. She'd be 117 today. <laughs> And the lady coming up there with the hat out of the church is mom's grandmother. Pretty neat. I tried on mom's wedding dress when I was about 15. I could not get it buttoned up. <laughs> we still have it. We have dad's suit too. <laughs> In 1975, four church members from the Collingwood Church that was all they had for four members. With the assistance of adherents, adherents and community supporters, they realized the need for a new updated church. 
By July 1976, the Collingwood Church hosted the entire BME conference for the very first time. We had always been known as the Collingwood BME Church. Other churches had official names. The Nathaniel Depp Memorial Church in Niagara Falls, E.A. Richardson Church in North Buxton, Salem Chapel, St. Catharines, Samuel R. Samuel R. Drake Memorial Church in Brantford, Christ Church in Toronto. In 1980, with respect to the early settlers and the founders of the original church, and in appreciation of the many friends and supporters, the name Heritage Community Church of Collingwood was adopted and incorporated. This little church has survived over the years because it has been a community church and a welcoming church. People of all cultures, heritage, and social status have been an important part of its growth. And when the church had no ministers from the BME connection to come, local lay preachers like Albert Walmsley, Elmer Kenwell, Harry Bell, Milt Hollingshead, they helped carry the services so that the church could go on. Reverend Cecil Brown held the pulpit for 13 years. And even our own Uncle Wilf, Reverend Wilf Sheffield, would rise up early on a Sunday morning, drive three and a half hours from Sundridge, come to service to preach, and be there before the members. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, he was there before the congregation, and he had the coffee going for us when we got there. But it's been that love and generosity of an entire community of family, friends, that has continually built this church building and kept it going. But it's been the love of God and the love for God that continues to build his church on the inside. We're still here. 146 years later, we're still here. And we have gone independent from the BME connection. And I'll just do a little side thing. A while ago in the 1990s, there was some graffiti on the top of the church. Some of you re might remember that. It was uh, posted in the Toronto Star that the little Collingwood Church, formerly of the BME Connection, had been um, targeted. Well, when some of the religious leaders of the BME Conference saw that we were formerly of their <laughs> conference, because we hadn't attended since 1986 and no one had contacted us, we just left. <laughs> All of a sudden, they wanted to make contact and find out what's going on in Collingwood. Well, they wanted to take us to court and take over our church, and the municipality stood up for us, people stood up for us, we stood up for ourselves. And finally, the conference backed down and said, we could have the church for a dollar. They never did get the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> But right now, we're in the middle of renovating. I don't know if some of you have driven by, but the little back end of the church where I said the, the kitchen was, where they served all the dinners, when we built the church in 1976, that little portion was taken off the church and set back and preserved, and then after the church was built, it was reattached, and we've used it as a Sunday school room and storage area. It's time to go. <laughs> So we are in the process of renovating that whole area, and by the grace of God, we are poor, we are small, we're a small congregation, small church, finances are even smaller, but God keeps opening doors for us, he brings people in that we don't expect, and I'm going to put them on the spot, one of our new pastors is sitting over here, we didn't know he was coming tonight, so we really have to behave, <laughs> Pastor John Stanley, we had no idea we were going to need a pastor. And up pops Pastor Stanley and another gentleman, Curry Phillips. They have just warmed our hearts and they just continue to bless us. And God is blessing them and blessing us through them. And our church is going on. The finances will come. We don't know how. We don't know how we've lasted 146 <laughs> years. But somehow we're here. And with your support, your prayers, God's blessing, We'll be here another 146 years. So thank you very much.
Does anybody have any questions? Because I know I do. I want to know where the church is in Collingwood. It's on Seventh Street. I do know that. It's right around the corner for me. But is that <coughs> is the original church is underneath that church, or did you just tear them all down? They're all gone. This is a, a new church here in 76, but you see the back corner in the, the back? Mm -hmm. That's the section that's coming down now. That is the. But as a heritage um, person, I would. I really want to get rid of that. Yeah. We won't donate it to you. <laughs> what about the interior? Did you keep it in the interior pews and everything? The pew, pews from the interior? Is the interior? Some of the original pews. This is what we plug for us. All right, Sheffield Park Black History Museum, come see us in the summer. <laughs> One more question. <laughs> you, you said the people came up through the trails from um, uh, from the south, mm -hmm. and this is the end of the road. No, one of them. It was one of the end of the road. Yeah. Do you know what houses they they ended up in? Was it one of the, Was it this church? A house like like where did they end up when they came? Like mm -hmm. they, they got out of the wagon. Obviously, they were hidden because they were afraid of being caught. Some of them went to Gray County. Yeah, yeah. Uh, home uh, all along the old Garrow Parks the trail. Through that era, Aaron Fergus up through Priceville, Northern, so, and some of the old um, establishments will be gone by now. Mm -hmm. But we can we can still plot where they lived and where they were. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I have something here as a thank you from the Collingwood yeah. District of Historical Society for you. So be an Thanks. Does anybody else have another question? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Please. Sure. Yeah. What year was your What year was your parents married? Oh, good for you, Bonnie. <laughs> I'm not going there. In the forties. In the forties. <laughs> Put it this way: Carolyn was a honeymoon baby, so I can't say when mom was married. <laughs> In the forties. And actually, the, the, the place where we live on Seventh Street, our our grandparents donated that land right on Seventh, so we're in the settlement, the whole area there. Thanks, Bonnie, that's very fair. <laughs> and the child is back there. I saw a question here. So, like Sylvia? Yes. 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 yes, sir. There were uh, two routes that, like, you came up through the, uh, sort of the Detroit area, but the uh, the churches in uh, Midhurst, that they, they came up with the other way, I think. I, okay. the, the African church in Edgar, the one yes. building, that was established for the black loyalists. They were free, they worked um, in the war veterans, the British. They, had, they were the first uh, how say this, black settlers to the area that were given land freely, that was deeded to them. So they were freed already, and they came up through the British colonies. Would they have come up later than the... Uh than people coming up to Buxton and that area? They, they predated Buxton. Or did they? Yes, they did. And it was Mr. Tim Crawford in the Oral area that found that information that the Oral Church predated the Buxton site. And that's why it became a national site over here in our area. Thanks, that's a good question. There's a gentleman back here that had a question. Hello, someone had a question at the back. I saw his hand or up. Or a comment. Oh, me. Hello. Oh, Yes, we have. The community has come in and part participates with us. We'll be doing something for Easter, and we need some men in our choir. Good Friday. We do. This was your practice run tonight. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the questions. I hope you come back next. Thanks very much.